Hi everyone and welcome to our November CBWA webinar. Great start everyone. Welcome to our CBWA webinar, Renewing Your Station's License, the ACMA's new B66 form uh, in partnership with the Community Media Training Organization. Thanks so much for joining us today. I've already seen quite a few people jump into the chat and say, hi, what station they're from. Um, so please feel free to do that if you haven't already. Um, before I kick off, I just want to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which I'm broadcasting from, that's the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation, and I pay my respects to elders past and present. So please feel free to uh, let us know what country you're joining us from today. Um, my name is Holly Friedlander Lydico. I'm the CBWA's Head of Advocacy and Communications and work very closely with um, our team or my team uh, with the ACMA to make sure that the sector is supported in its regulation, understands its regulation, and that the ACMA um, also has a deep understanding of community broadcasting, which I'm grateful that they do. So to kick things off, um, what will we be covering today? Oh, before I do that, actually, if you've got any accessibility requirements, um, we do have a PowerPoint presentation that's up on the slide, uh, up on the screen. So please feel free to drop a line in the chat if you've got any accessibility requirements, if I can help in any way. Um, also, if you've got any questions, please drop them into the chat and uh, we'll answer them throughout as we can or towards the end, you'll have plenty of opportunity as well. So in this webinar, um, we're going to touch on briefly just a bit about sector regulation and what the CBWA's role in regards to that is. And then we're going to introduce our guests and we're going to discuss sort of the key changes to the new B66 form, which is the license renewal form for permanent community broadcasters and get some tips to help you with your renewal. And of course, you'll find out what support and resources are available to help you in that process. And as I've already mentioned, you'll have an opportunity to ask questions. Um, so joining me today, I'm very excited. We've got Hugh Clappen and Amanda Henson from the ACMA. Hugh is the, a, the manager of the Community Broadcasting and Safeguards section. If you want to give a wave, Hugh, I can see he's joining from the Sydney ACMA offices today. Um, and Amanda Henson, who's the Senior Licensing and Compliance Officer, who's worked a lot on the new B66 form. So um, they'll be here to talk to you and answer your questions throughout. So I thought I would just start really briefly with a bit of an overview of sort of where we're at and how did we get here. Um, so I guess I've been at the CBWA for five years in a various number of roles and working very closely with members to really understand what your challenges are um, in regards to lots of different things, but particularly in regards to regulation and licensing. Um, and over the years, we've gotten feedback from our members, whether that's verbal feedback or written feedback, or whether we've discussed individual situations through investigation reports that are published on the ACMA website or from your license renewals and the conversations that you've had with the ACMA. And traditionally, a lot of the feedback has been that the license renewal process can be quite lengthy, it can be quite resource heavy, and sometimes feels very onerous on our member stations. And of course, there's always um, the need to make sure that our members feel like they understand what they need to do, that they can easily meet um, their regulation um, requirements and compliance requirements. And of course, do the best that they can to make sure that you're serving your community interest in the best possible way. So we've worked really closely with the ACMA over many years, but particularly in the last few months um, on their B66 form, they put open the consultation to us and other sector leaders, including First Nations Media Australia, Christian Media Arts Australia, um, and the NEMBC, the National Ethnic Multicultural Broadcasters Council. And we've provided some feedback just as to our members' experience and on a proposed draft form. And I'm very pleased to say that the new B66 form is very streamlined. It really asks um, very clear questions and I hope you'll find it a much easier process than you have in the past. So looking forward to um, really seeing the results of this new form. And of course, as always, please don't hesitate to get in contact with us 
if you've got feedback on the form, if you've got suggestions for how it could be better once you go through the process, because it's a continual process of improvement. It's a continual dialogue between the CBA and our members, of course, the ACMA and our members and ACMA and the CBA. So we all just wanted to keep chatting to make sure that we're helping you the best that we possibly can. So any feedback is always really appreciated. And of course, if you've got any questions in the process. So that's a little bit of just the CBA's role to date. So I thought I would now hand things over to Hugh Coffin at the ACMA um, to give a bit of an update on form. Thanks, Holly. And can I just check you can hear me because I had a bit of audio problem earlier this morning. You sure can. I sure can. Lovely. Thanks. Thanks very much for that. And I'd also like to acknowledge the traditional owners. Um, the ACMA has offices in Canberra, Sydney and Melbourne. The um, the main thing I wanted to do today is just give you a sense of what we've changed in the new form, in the streamlined form uh, for renewal of community radio licences. And secondly, and as part of that, just reinforce what it is at a high level we're looking for, what what the renewal process is from, from where we sit, from, from how we look at it. Um, Holly, will I ask you to go to the next slide? Is that, yeah, next slide, please, thanks. Um, fundamentally, the ACMA is a creature of legislation and of parliament and don't want to bore you too much with the legislation, but it is the essence and the framework for community broadcasting and it's what we have to pay very close attention to. And it's very, very relevant to renewal. So it's the Broadcasting Services Act 1992, that's a bit of legislation passed by the Australian Parliament 1992, that sets the framework up for um, for this whole process of renewing community radio licences every five years. It's a requirement in the BSA that licensees apply, put in application in, to have their long-term licence renewed every five years. And of course, under the law, if no application is made, the licence just expires. So just to make sure that that's kind of the law, that's just how it works. If you don't give us an application, there, the licence expires and just ends so it's quite a it, it is an important matter and it's a very important issue in terms of keeping the station keeping your stations going um, so we are absolutely guided by um, the bsa and in many cases we're doing what we just have to do what the bsa requires us to do the way we consider community broadcasting renewals is to ask ourselves would we allocate this license to this licensee if this was the initial allocation process. If we were if we we're at that stage of giving out a new licence, and as many people are aware, we do that very, very seldom now. It's a very established industry, about 350 long-term licensees now. But when we do go out a new licence, and when we did in the past for all the licensees, I presume, um, listening today as part of this webinar, we went through a process, the ASMA went through a process, or prior to that, the ABA, of uh, looking at criteria under the Broadcasting Services Act to see should this person be given a licence. And it's those same matters that we are looking at when we're looking at renewal. And we're asking ourselves the question, would we allocate this licence to this licensee if it was an initial allocation process? What that means too, and I want people to be really clear about this, if you're running a successful community radio station, this should be pretty straightforward. Like, I, I do appreciate there's paperwork involved, but fundamentally what you're doing is saying, this is how we're doing our job. This is how we are continuing to provide a community service through our community broadcasting license. It's not, ideally, the community, the, the, the community broadcasting renewal process shouldn't be about creating a whole bunch of paperwork just for the sake of appeasing the ACMA. It's actually about demonstrating what you're doing as a broadcaster running a radio station in the community. Can I have the next slide, please, Holly? So the key elements at a high level that we are looking for, and this is guided by, I don't want to get too much in detail, but section 84, subsection two of the Broadcasting Services Act, this is where I get this from, not making it up, representing community interest, broadcasting material of local significance, and the capacity of the licensee the management capacity, the financial capacity, the compliance capacity, compliance with license conditions. These are the key sort of elements we're looking at when we're asking ourselves, would we give this, would we give a community broadcasting license to this licensee? Um, 
representing the community interest. So every um, every license has every community broadcasting license has a community interest that is represented by that licensee. Now, in many cases, it's the general geographic, that is the general community of that license area. Um, and if you've ever seen, if you've noticed on your license that one of the very critical things in the license is what's your license area. The boundaries of that license area are available on the ASMA website, you're welcome to look at them, but that's the community that you are serving and that's the community interest that you're representing is in that license area. Um, so it's about local, it's about representing and engaging with your local community. Broadcasting material of local significance is um, very closely related to representing your community interest. And it's usually, you know, it's, it's very common that one of the key ways that people represent their community interest is by broadcasting material of local significance. That phrase, material of local significance, is defined in legislation. And I think we give the definition on the form, on the V66 form, the renewal form. Um, and it's basically local content. It's what, what we might ordinarily think of as local content, but it's pretty broadly defined. But fundamentally, it's content that relates to the license area. Um, and local content is, is a reasonable shorthand, but, some, but it can go, the defined term goes a little bit broader than that. The third thing that I'm drawing your attention to here is capacity. This is where I think it feels um, for, for many people that we're asking you information that's not really about running a radio station, it's about your constitution and your finances and um, things like that. These are critical elements to keeping the radio station going. They're also critical elements, particularly when we think about things like compliance, to the regulatory requirements of holding a community broadcasting license. So we're interested in management capacity for a few reasons. First of all, we're interested in management capacity to demonstrate that you're able to keep this thing going. Whether it's a tiny, you know, very small operation, entirely volunteer run, or a very large operation with a lot of money, employees, uh, a lot of resources. It's our interest is, well, we, we, this is a radio license that will go for some time. Demonstrate to us that you've got the capacity that you know what you're doing in terms of running that station. The financial capacity, I mean, that amounts to the finances and you know, ask for, for, for basically have a look at the books to get a sense that you're solvent. And one of the things we look for, we've seen it particularly with COVID recently, some stations have run at a deficit for, for, for a recent year. It's not that that is a problem. What we're interested in is that you know that, you've clocked that, and you're working out how, how, to, how to work out of that, how to get out of that financial hole, or it's a planned deficit that's to do with a, a big significant um, uh, equipment upgrade or, or something like that. It's about demonstrating you're across it and you're not turning a blind eye to it. And remember, when you're filling out the form and you're answering these questions, from where we sit in our offices, in our bureaucrat offices, we're very much working on the paperwork and we're very much working on the evidence you're giving us. And we have these, these kind of little snapshots of what you're doing and how your station runs. And so we're, we're, we're very much dependent on what you tell us about what's going on. And we're very interested in you demonstrating to us that you are across your own brief. That's really what, what we're doing here. Compliance is important because there are regulatory requirements as you all know, there are conditions of your license in the Broadcasting Services Act, and you must also comply with the CBWA codes of conduct. So demonstrating you're able to do that is very important to us. And if you've had compliance issues, whether it's through engagement with the ACMA or people have complained to you, we want to understand a bit more about that. The fact you've had a complaint is not a black mark against your name. It's how you've dealt with it. It's how you've managed that. There's also, I just want to take the opportunity here to draw the really important connection between management and compliance here. Um, one of the things you find us doing is we care deeply about what to some people might look like very obscure parts of your constitution. Like if, if a member is expelled or is not, a membership application is not accepted, is there a right of reply? Now, there's a, there's a couple of really important reasons we're focused on something like that. The first is you have a license condition, you the licensees have a license condition to encourage the participation of the community in both the operations and, and, and the, the programming of the station. That's a very clear license condition. If your membership practices are too restrictive, you're not you're at risk of not meeting 
that, that license condition. But secondly, and in a sense more really, when things go wrong, and that's so often what we see from the compliance end, we see the, but we don't see all the wonderful things that are going on with community broadcasting all the time. We like to try and make an effort to, but so often what is brought to our attention is when things go wrong. And so often these are conflicts that um, can be managed and can be managed before getting to the ACMA, particularly if you've got good, strong governance that looks at things like um, mediation, that looks at things like dealing with unhappiness and engaging with um, people who do have problems with the station, whether it's an individual thing or a systematic thing. So for that reason, because in the end there are these license conditions and because the ACMA gets to see the pointy end, we, are, we, are, we do look carefully at these management compliance matters. But I don't want to overemphasize them because they really, you know, you don't want the, the, the tail to wag the dog here. Fundamentally, your renewal application is where you're demonstrating to the regulator that you're running a decent, you're running a valuable radio station. You're providing a valuable service to your local community. That's the point of it. That's the point of the exercise. Next slide, if you could. Thanks, Holly. Sure, thank you. And I'll just take this opportunity to say we have had a question from Chris Ball pretty much on this particular matter in regards to governance. So Chris, we'll come back to that at the end because um, I think you raised a really good point. And um, if anyone else has questions, please check them in and we'll get to them at the end of this. Thank you. Thanks, Holly. So I just want to go through some of the specifics. Um, so why why did we update? Well, we wanted to streamline the process. We wanted to reduce the administrative burden. We've heard that people would enjoy it. Um, and it is also meant when, when people feel obliged to give us you know, hundreds of pages of paper, we are obliged to read hundreds of pages of paper. The question is, is it necessary? Is it actually helping us do our regulatory role, which is ensuring that the licence, the, the, that community broadcasting licences are held by uh, held by people and, 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 and used in a way that meet the objects of the Broadcasting Services Act. I mean, that's our role. Um, and so we've had particular focus on only collecting the information that we need to make the kind of assessment I've talked about before. Next slide, please, Holly. So um, things that haven't changed. This is only a form. It doesn't change the law. The requirements have not changed. Um, in the renewal process, we still, you know, it hasn't changed our capacity to uh, decline to renew a license. If under the, you know, we look at these matters under 694 and we thought, no, we wouldn't allocate that license in the first place. That is one of the key reasons that we have to decline to renew. It happens very, very, very rarely, I can assure you. Um, we can still request further information. We've done that in the past. We will do that in the future. Um, the, we can still ask for um, information that we might have had on the old form as a matter of course. We don't need it from everybody, but sometimes we need it from some people. And so we, if we do need it, because what's, what we've been given in the application doesn't fill the picture out enough, we will ask for more information. Some of that might have been information on the old form. Some of it might just be additional information that we need in order to make our assessment in the context of this particular station that we're looking at. Next slide, thanks, Holly. So key changes. We th you should find it shorter. It's you know, page counts lower, and and we think you should find it. What you're submitting to us is probably less content as well. I think um, we're only collecting the information we absolutely need to make the assessment. We've tried to clarify the questions. We recognise that some of those questions were a little ambiguous, a little bit unclear. Certainly one or two, I remember when I first started in this job, I was looking at the form going, I don't know what that question means. I, like, I don't know how to answer that question. So if I don't know how to answer it, I don't know how I can expect any other people to. So we've definitely tried to correct and fix those sort of things. And the, the input from the industry groups such as CBAA has been really helpful there. Um, and we've tried to be less prescriptive. We recognise that there's a broad range of organisations of huge range of capacity um, filling out these forms. Community broadcasting is significantly a volunteer um, uh, industry, and so we recognise that people's time is precious, and we're, we're also, you know, recognise that we're dealing with people um, for whom filling out a renewal form for the ACMA is not necessarily the most significant, most important part of their life. Um, so we've tried to recognise that by being less prescriptive and giving people more freedom to provide information in the format that's convenient to them. Um, the, the balance here is that we need to make these assessments about, you know, would we give this licence to 
this licensee for allocating it in the first place. Um, and so, yeah, we, we, it is a form. We ask for information provided in a certain form, but we are trying to be less prescriptive. You know, we, we've got fewer of the tables saying, fill out this table in exactly this way. Next slide, if you could, Holly. So, um, for example, you know, we, we no longer ask for a, a list of documents to show, to, to provide us with, with a series of documents um, showing the actions you've taken. We no longer ask you how you've responded to community needs and interests you've identified. The approach instead is say, look, focus on five community engagement activities you've undertaken in the past 12 months. Five, by the way, is not a particularly magic number. Um, you don't have to stop at five. And if you really, really can't think of five, maybe that's not a problem. But the point is, can you demonstrate you're engaging with your community? Um, and the second thing we ask you to do is, will you tell us what does your station do in the area that other services do not do? This is about you demonstrating why this license, why this service under this license is really adding something to the local community in your license area. It's a very important part of both representing community interest and Often it's where um, you'll, you'll be telling us about the material of local significance. Next slide, if you could, thanks. So um, we used to have, I think it was my least favorite table in the form, was the breakdown of material of local significance. Or, um, and what we've instead tried to do is say, look, everyone's gonna have a program schedule. If you can't provide a program schedule, that's a problem. I think everyone knows what they're actually broadcasting every week. And focus, tell us your story around that. Tell us your story around your program schedule, where you identify the material of local significance, and through the program schedule, you, are, you explain how it meets the needs of the community. So that, that, that's like just an example of where we've tried to sort of shift the, the focus so it's more flexible. Program schedules are different, and the way people describe the programs are different. We're probably still asking you to do a bit of work that's not just in the schedule. You need to explain what's special about this program, what's special about that program. But if you focus it around the schedule, then we're all dealing with the same. I guess the same starting point in terms of your station and the service you provide in your local area. Next slide, thanks, Holly. Um, we used to ask for a formal five-year business plan, five-year budget, financial statements for the past two years. Look, the point of the business plan is, this goes to the management capacity issue fundamentally. Are you thinking ahead? Is this licensee looking ahead to challenges that are gonna come down the pipe? Is this more than a day-to-day -day proposition? Are people actually thinking about meeting future community needs? How to engage with a changing community, a, a, a community that's that's evolving and so on. A five-year business plan is a terrific way to do that. I've, I've got nothing against five-year business plans, but the, the idea that, that every community broadcasting licensee must have a five-year business plan, I don't know. That doesn't sound quite right to me. So what we've done instead is say, look, Tell us about your objectives. What are the emerging challenges? Show us that you're thinking ahead and tell us how you're preparing for those challenges. A five-year business plan could be the way to do that, but there are other ways of doing that. And that's the kind of the flexibility we're, 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 we're trying to put in place there. Um, we've also cut down just to one year of just the most recent financial statement rather than the previous two years. Um, there are cases we're gonna to ask to go back more than one year. Um, that, that will happen, but as a matter of course for everyone, you know, I think the, the, the starting point is we'll just show us, show us that you're solvent, show us basically where the money's coming from and where it's going and um, whether you're, you know, operating at a surplus or a, a deficit. If you're working in deficit, the key thing there is to explain to us how that's going to change because clearly no one can operate at a deficit forever. Um, you, you tell us about that. Next slide, if you could, thanks, Holly. And that was it. I'm was done it. with my bit. <laughs> Thanks very much. But Thank happy to take questions when we're finished. Thank you so much. Um, I will just add up to that point. You know, Hugh touched on quite a few times sort of the less prescriptive and more flexible nature of the new form. And, I, and a key thing that we've heard from our members um, over many, many years is, of course, that we know that all of our stations are unique and your communities are unique, whether you're serving a First Nations community or an RPH community or a remote community or a suburban community. Um, how you meet your community, how you engage with your community to find out what they want for your service is going to be different. So that's been a huge driver to the more flexible nature of the form. Really 
find, having more ability to really, in a narrative sense, um, at least initially, understand develop, describe how you're meeting that community need. And of course, there might be a few follow-up questions that ask for a few numbers, volunteer numbers or member numbers or whatever it might be, but now you've got an opportunity to really clearly articulate in narrative how you're doing it. And we think that's a really significant and exciting change in the form. Um, so that's been really great. Um, the other key thing I thought I might just mention really briefly before we move on to this bit, which is tips for success and then move for your questions. So thanks for the people that have popped some questions in the chat already. Um, I guess on a broader regulation, uh, red tape reduction sort of process, you know, we understand that community broadcasters have to report to lots of different regulators. So obviously every five years you need to complete your your license renewal with the ACMA, you'll need to provide your financial statements every year if you're a charity to the ACNC or um, to your fair trading body or to ORIC if you're a First Nations organisation. And so it can be a lot to report to all these different government, government bodies. And we have um, suggested and we're working through this at the moment, what it could look like in the future, um, you know, for the form currently you need to provide your constitution and your financial statements to the ACMA. But if you're a charity with the, registered with the ACNC, you already provide those to the ACNC every year. So we're looking at and we're in discussions about, well, what would it look like if you report once to the ACNC and then the ACMA could get that information about your charity and you wouldn't have to provide it. So while that hasn't happened as yet, because it's a bit of a long process that we're exploring, I guess the point that I want to make is if you're not a charity already, all of our stations are able to become charities. You're all eligible as not-for-profit entities. And it's really actually quite a simple and straightforward process. So I really would encourage you to think about it um, at your station if you'd like to become a charity. We're obviously happy to help you with that process if you want some more information. And it really opens a whole lot of doors for you in the future. So if you wanted to get do more fundraising, for example, um, if you wanted to get deductible, deductible gift recipient status, for your fundraising efforts, all those kinds of things, being a charity sort of the step one. But obviously in the future, we're really hoping that if you're a charity, it'll make it easier for us to reduce your reporting requirement in the future. So that's just a bit of a side tangent, food for thought. Um, my contact details will be at the end if you want more info about that. But if so, we just go through a couple of tips for success. I think the most people here uh, looking at renewals in the next couple of months because we know there's quite a few of them. Um, so some of this will be obviously for people filling out the form now, but if you're sort of planning ahead and your renewals in a couple of years, this obviously is going to help you as well. I think the biggest thing as possible is plan ahead. So your license, we really encourage you to get your application in 12 months prior to the expiry date. So plan ahead. The ACMA will send you a renewal note, uh, reminder about 14 months out. Uh, we're obviously on, on call to talk to you guys whenever you may need. But have a look at the form early. Build a team at your station. Figure out who's going to do what. Divvy up the workload. You know, sometimes the license renewal gets shoved onto one person, which is always a bit sad for that person, I think. It's a team effort. And, um, you know, if you can put a bit of a team together, it'll make the process a lot smoother. And of course, in your renewal period, have a look at the form and keep records. Um, you know, make sure you're filing your five-year renewal form. Unfortunately, the ACMA can't provide it to you. So we really want you to keep good records, keep your license application from the last time on file if you need it, if you need to look at it. Um, keep your financial statements, keep your constitution, all those things that you'll need. Keep records of um, obviously your program grid and all those sorts of things. Hugh's already mentioned this one, but undertake genuine community in engagement. It's really the cornerstone of what we do as community broadcasters, and it's really an underpinning part of the form. So make sure that you're surveying your community, make sure what the, you find out what they want from your service, conduct focus groups, hold OBs and talk to people face to face, talk to your community group, see what kind of CSAs they want to play. Community engagement is a two-way conversation between you and your community, so find out what they want. And of course, the ACMA, uh, are here to help. Don't hesitate to call them right here. Call them anytime. They'll be there ready to chat. Um, and I mean that as well. If you're worried that you might be running a bit late or you're a bit confused about the form, please call the ACMA. They're not scary. I promise you. They're lovely people. They just want to help. 
Um, they're not going to get you in trouble if you're running a little bit late unless you're really, 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 really late. But if you're a little bit late, please just call them and have a chat to them. All they want to know is just to make sure that you've got everything you need to get your form in. So please don't hesitate to call them. Um, and, of course, you can talk to the CBAA. Um, so we've just updated our license renewal resource in our resource library, which will go live after this webinar. So we've got um, policy templates to help you and, of course, guidance and advice for completing the form. And, of course, the community media training organisation can also help you. Um, so if you're on a bit more of a longer time frame for your licence renewal and you want to get some training and guidance, um, they can help with some tailored packages around governance, strategic planning, programming review, um, compliance, of course, and also talk about some one-on-one -on -one consulting as well. So Jordy's uh, in the chat if you've got questions for CMTO. She'll probably drop some links in as well, which will circulate at the end of this session. All right, that's enough from us, I reckon, for the moment. Anyway, let's turn to some questions. Um, we've got Chris Ball at City Park Radio, and I might I might answer this one first year and then throw to you if that's okay. But Chris has asked, um, traditionally in the past, ACMA sort of wanted some limited committee tenures in constitutions. Um, but how does that sort of work when maybe members are really happy with your committee and no matter how much you try, you can't get new committee members um, surely the focus should be on how well that we're servicing our license area. So Chris, I think that's a really good question. Um, I think on a more broader level, if we're talking about good governance, you know, tenure limits are really important. Maybe it's three or four terms. So maybe that's nine, 10, 12 years, depending on your term limits with that person stepping off the board for one year before they can be reelected. That just gives an opportunity for that renewal. There are obviously circumstances where some people might be on the board for 20 or 30 years, and that doesn't necessarily encourage good and true community engagement, and people don't want to necessarily put their hand up. So just by having those 10-year limits, it really encourages fresh blood and fresh faces and gives people an opportunity to want to get involved. So I guess the CBA does recommend 10-year limits, but we also appreciate that there might be certain circumstances if you're in a really small town, you know, I know towns, 3,000 people, 4,000 people, it's really hard to find good people to be on your board. So obviously it really does depend on your community. Um, but that's my thoughts. Hugh, did you have anything you'd like to add to that? Thanks, Holly. Um, yeah, uh, what I'd say is that from our perspective, what we're looking at, we're going to start with things like the licence conditions. And the words we have to go and look at here are encouraging participation. Are you encouraging participation in the operations? Now, the absence or presence of a particular tenure limit, you know, th that in itself doesn't mean you are or are not complying with that licence condition, but it's the full package. And the this is where the compliance history comes in. If at the station where we're aware there's been, you know, real issues with stagnation, um, because those things have been brought to our attention in a range of ways, then we, you know, we can really see tenure limits as part of the solution. To, to that problem because there's the license condition to represent the committee interest and the license condition to encourage participation. So the, there's a reason why the ACMA bangs on about tenure limits. The reason why the ACMA bangs on about tenure limits is because it's really going to this issue of committee engagement. It doesn't mean that it's a be all and end all. It doesn't mean that it's a strict rule that must be complied with from our perspective, but it's definitely a um, uh, an issue. So. Um, the question, Chris, kind of gives us, is part of what we're looking for, is that if if you've got a history, you know, if what you've got is a committee, very long standing, people have been there for years, um, but it's not a problem and you can demonstrate it's not a problem, that's all we need to know. Um, and it's it's only it's that it is part of a picture we see. And as I say, one of the problems of being the regulator is you see the problems. What we see is the very minority of stations and situations where things have gone bad. And one of the ways in which things go bad sometimes is where you end up with people who dominate, you know, individuals who get to dominate the station when other people are really trying to get involved and there are the station is not and the station's 
you know, programming and so on is not evolving with the community. So that's the problem. There's a problem we're trying to fix, or what we are trying to, I guess, recognise by when we talk about tenure limits. And fundamentally, the problem is about community engagement. If community engagement and representing the community interest is not a problem, and you can show us it's not a problem, then we're probably not going to have a big deal, a, a lot to say about community tenure. Um, but we do, you know, it's part of representing the community, and I fully support what, what, what Holly said, about wanting that kind of ability for refreshing and for change, because it is about being continually, continuously responsive to change, um, is a big part of what I think is necessary in order to represent community interest. Thanks, Hugh. And we've got a comment from Bob and Jean Rao. Um, hi, Bob and Jean, nice to hear from you. Um, with COVID-19 and lockdowns in Melbourne, community engagement has obviously been particularly difficult. I guess I'm interested, Hugh, how does the ACMA sort of um, consider COVID-19 lockdown and restrictions for any applicants that might be putting their renewals in sort of now and reflecting on the past 18 months? Thanks, Holly. Um, the want to be really clear that we get that COVID has been a problem, particularly it's been different, a different kind of problem in different places. But Melbourne in particular has been very hard hit in the last couple of years, as has Sydney. Lockdown, I completely understand what you're saying. Whereas so many people have had to um, cancel their usual community events, whether it's outside broadcasts, whether it's, you know, community festival engagements, whether it's, you know, the, the, the various kinds of being out there talking to people. And um, that, you know, COVID just has not permitted that. Stations, of course, have also had restrictions on the capacity for people to even work in the station. People, uh, I know a lot of stations have found very creative means to stay on air and, and keep their local presenters on air without necessarily having to come to the studio, which has been terrific to see. The short answer is, I mean, A, there's some there's some words we put on our website back in March or April last year saying, look, we understand COVID's going to be a problem and we will take that into account. Um, and certainly in renewals, it's the, 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 the there's no question that part of the story at the moment we kind of expect people to be telling us is the COVID story but nonetheless you still have obligations to represent your community interest and to encourage engagement um, how you do that might have to change and there might need to be a th th there has been this kind of temporary problem um, with engagement and we recognize that but part of the thing here is look at the longer history of the last five years, look at the future, what are you planning to do in the future? It's that full story that we're interested in. But yes, we understand COVID, you know, there've been public health orders, you can't just go out there and breach public health orders. And we, there's no question that we would be um, uh, creating problems for licensees because of COVID. And I think that's one of those things that's a really good example of, you know, here's an issue that you've found as a station, how do you tell the narrative around it how do you describe that? Oh, we've, we've, this was an issue. <laughs> this is what we did. This is how we pivoted to use the word of 2022 uh, to, I don't know, engage with our community online or send out a survey or, you know, also we just had to shut shop for three months to protect our community. And now this is what we're doing in the future. So essentially there's no wrong answer as long as you can try, try to articulate the best that you possibly can, how you responded to the, to the incident at hand. Um, Betty is interested in DGR status. Great, Betty. I'll get you somebody from the member team to give you a call after this. We've got Philip Crosby from 2RDJ in Sydney. Um, he's new to the station or fairly new to community radio. He's not running the tech side of things. Um, we're obviously talking about a five-year renewal process for you for permanently licensed community broadcasters, but his records indicate that they've been getting a 12-month renewal. Off the top of my head, 2RDJ is definitely a permanently licensed station, so they should be undertaking five-year license renewals. Um, obviously, if anybody here is joining us who is a temporary community broadcasting license service, that's a different form and that's a different process, and that is 12 months. Um, is there anything I'm missing, Hugh, for 2RDJ? No, I haven't looked at... I mean, I can check the records for 2RDJ, but that sounds right to me as well. I don't know what the 12 month thing would be unless it was a temporary license, which as you say, is a completely different set of, set of processes. So maybe we can take that one on Phil, uh, notice Phil and either myself or Hugh can have a chat with you offline and help you out there. Um, Betty's got a question. <laughs> what happens when your record keeping is a bit dodge? Um, 
there's been a few different records kept on site and off site, um, something they want to work on. Look, it's a it is a tricky one, Betty. I completely appreciate, particularly if there's been a bit of a turnover at the station, boards leaving or key personnel leaving, and sometimes it's a bit hard to find records. I think my advice would really be to have a look at the new form first and foremost and figure out what you need to provide because there's obviously quite a lot less that you need to actually physically provide this time um, compared to the old form. But uh, I think just I would start, stop and take a bit of an audit first and foremost and figure out what you need um, and then try and contact those people and sort of work from the ground up. And you could sort of start with the priority documents. Um, I think that was probably the best way to go about it. We've got a question from Clayton from 89.9 The Light in Melbourne. Thanks, Clayton. Um, so Hugh, this one's for you. Um, very interesting question. Obviously, you've referred back to the Act a few times and how when you get a license renewal, you think, well, the ACMA thinks, would this station get this license if it was coming for the first time? Does that mean the ACMA does not take into account previous license renewals and the history of the station as a whole when giving the license renewal? Is it simply this one form and this one license renewal only that you consider? Short answer is no, we do consider the history, but the history is there in our records. The history is there also in the form itself because the, you know, the, your response to the form is giving us um, some information about certainly the recent history. Um, but we do look at what we have on file on and particularly past renewals. So a standard thing we'll do um, often at renewal, the ACMA may, may have made some suggestions for uh, improving compliance of things that the station could do a bit differently to make to bring it more into compliance or ensure that it's closer to or better complying with with with, with legislation and we usually ask uh, stations to let us know when they've done that or report to us on something um, so that's one of the first things we will look as a routine thing with renewal is did they do last the renewal actions from last time and if they didn't that will definitely um, be something that that we will comment on and will will take into effect uh, take into account. So, um, I mean, Clayton, I hope that answers the question. The we absolutely are interested in now and the future, an ancient history that's water under the bridge that's not relevant to now and the future. We we wouldn't want to take into account, but some things are. So it's it's a bit hard in the abstract to say we don't take into account any history, but I would say the focus is very much on the current renewal and where the station's going, um, and probably I, I guess to connect it to the previous question about where the record keeping hasn't been ideal, um, if you've acknowledged that you know if that's sort of becoming clear through the renewal process, acknowledging it and explaining how that's going to be improved in the in the future is part of what we need to know. Um, and you also need to you need to carry through on that because every five years we'll ask you you know we're going through this process again, and so if we see you know if we ask you to do something differently with your record keeping or with something else, um, there will be an opportunity in five years' time to say so. How did that go? Has that improved? So it's not simply about telling us what we want to hear this year. It is about actually genuinely improving the processes so that next time it's easier. Um, look, the last thing I wanted to say that kind of connect those points together, and it relates very much to Holly, what Holly was saying about preparing. Um, I know, you know, it's quite like a lot of people online at the moment are dealing with a renewal that's due quite soon, you know, that your licence expires within the next 12 months, for example. Um, and this is less helpful for those, but I would be starting the next renewal immediately after this one is complete, you know, it's not that you've got you've got five years of work to do, but just think ahead. You know, the, the, the renewal process doesn't end when the ACMA writes you a letter saying, oh, we've renewed your licence. I think my suggestion would be that stations at that point make a record of, okay, what did we learn from this and what, what how shall we do it next time? So, because if the, the problem arises, and we do see this again, I see the problems, not all the good things, but one of the problems we have seen is where people leave it to the last minute and then there is one person who's left holding the baby and they've got a tiny amount of time and they're expected to do all this work all by themselves with no history and no background. It's just not fair, frankly. Um, so just wanted to basically reinforce Holly's point about team and start early in thinking about it and won't be too onerous then. It's really, you know, I'll stop there. Thanks, you. Um, we've got a couple more questions, so let's see how we can get through them all. Um, we've got Belinda from Gippsland FM. 
Um, great question, Belinda. Are renewals staggered for every station at the same time or are they due at the same time? Ours expires in August 2025. So great question. August 2025, if that's when your license expires, that means you're looking to get your application in about August 2024. So you're here very early and planning ahead, which is what I like to see, Belinda, and goes to Hugh's point just now. Um, in regards to whether they're staggered, or um, it's 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 sort of it's a bit random. But this year coming is when the ACMA has about 120 Hugh renewals. There we go. Some reason I'm not keeping the number on the top of my mind, Holly, but that's not implausible. So essentially, I've said to a few of our members, if you're in the next sort of 12 month bracket, you are in the biggest cohort of license renewals. So be kind to the ACMA if you don't hear anything, good news is good news typically, um, but there are quite a few of you coming up. But for the most part, some years there's 10 or 20, and then there's this one big year. So it's just it just really is dependent on when your station started. Um, the, the, and, and just by the way, it's mostly uh, the hump that we have, you know, shouldn't you? Shouldn't you? Good word to use anyway, but anyway, the the, the large block um, that we have, uh, it's to do with the 992 Act coming into effect in 992. So basically, all the licensees that had a license under the old legislative regime were deemed to have a license from that commenced roughly October 1992. So every five years, this happens, um, and otherwise, it's just five years from the date the license was allocated. Um, so there's no fun magic fact. to it. Fun fact, didn't know that. It's good. I'll remember that one. Um, Bob and Jing Mao again for Northwest FM in Melbourne. They have been asked to send, obviously, the most recent approved AGM minutes. They had to postpone the 2020 and 2021 meetings. Um, so the most recent approved meetings will be 2020 or 2019, maybe, typo. Is this really acceptable, acceptable when we apply to renew in 2022? So... It's not great, um, but remember that for us, the obligation is around, you know, as I say, it's the license conditions around um, encouraging community participation. And we're considering these matters, section 84, subsection two, things like, are you um, representing the community interest? What's your governance capacity? What's your compliance capacity? And so on, material local significance. Um, so it's not that we have a rule about AGMs, though very often the state or the, 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 the uh, regulatory agency with which your organisation is registered may have rules and breaching those rules about having, when you have your AGMs, they, they're called annual for a reason, um, that will raise problems, questions in our mind about um, you know, sort of governance capacity, measuring capacity. But of course, there's been COVID. And I don't know if perhaps what you're saying is that the lack of AGMs has been entirely sanctioned by the the, 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 the regulatory agency covering your um, organisation's registration. That's usually state-based, um, uh, though there's, there's in some cases as well. Um, and if, that, if that's the case, then I think you want to explain... What, what you're explaining to us is... Community, encouraging community participation. Not having an AGM for years on end does raise warning bells about community participation. So it's not, like I said, look, it's not great, but if there's a story to tell about it and there's a reason for it and, and you'll be going back to them and, and fundamentally your story about community participation over a long term is a good one, then it's not overall a problem. But um, yeah, it, it's a worry. Thanks, you. And yeah, I think in some states there's obviously been different requirements around pushing AGMs back or, or or holding them. So I think Bob and Jean, if that's the case for you, as long as you can articulate that, that um, is the best outcome there. We've got a question from Nigel Green uh, in relation to question 11A. He's interested in thoughts on volunteers being members and what constitutes an acceptable fee for membership. And indeed, if there should be a sliding scale, COVID's obviously thrown a lot of normal expert, expert, uh, la, 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 normalness out the window, like my ability to communicate. I think, Nigel, um, it's a really good question. And in regards to what constitutes an acceptable fee for membership, I think it's really about, again, it comes back to community engagement, right? What, who's your community? What's the makeup of your community? Is it a low socioeconomic area? Do you have lots of pensioners or students or, I don't know, whoever it might be? And 
consulting with them to design a membership scale that is effect, effective, you know. Um, there are definitely stations that have concession fees uh, for members and that's a very common practice. Um, so I think COVID's a great time to rethink it all and, um, you know, maybe there's some circumstances where you might need to waive fees for 12 months for some people or whatever it might be. But um, essentially, uh, volunteers can be members in some stations that I know volunteers have to be members and that's a, that's part of the volunteering contract and that's how stations ensure the financial viability and the the buy the buy in from volunteers to support the station. Um, so that's something that can be quite common. Um, but they're my thoughts. I don't know if you have anything to add to you. Um, look, I would just add that um, uh, there's no you know we don't have a rule. We don't have a fee, and that's f uh, partly for the reasons that Holly's suggesting that it it really is a contextual thing. It might depend on your community interest might depend on the nature of your community it might depend whether you've got you know you're just serving a tiny little town or an entire big metropolitan city and so on and so forth um so there's no simple one size fits all thing what we are looking for and this is where you'll start hearing you know me say the same thing again and again we're looking at things like is there a barrier to participation here if you're setting the if you're setting the fee so high you know so if your membership fee is a hundred thousand dollars we're probably going to have a problem with that because we're probably going to say that's not encouraging participation. Now, I use that ludicrous example just as an extreme. That's why we ask the question because we're looking for barriers to participation because encouraging participation is absolutely core to community broadcasting as it's constructed by the Broadcasting Services Act. So we're looking, we're asking these questions partly about barriers to participation. Um, and again, the, the the volunteers being members thing, again, it's not a hard and fast rule, but it, it's sometimes, you know, the, as part of a bigger picture, you do get, you know, there are some stations where the um, requiring a volunteer to become a member actually dis is a bit of a barrier to participation. But it's not always the case. And as Holly says, there's, you know, there can be cases where it's entirely the right thing to be doing. Um, so we're asking these questions partly to build a picture and, you know, there's very often not a single right or wrong answer. It's about the picture it's telling us of how this station operates, particularly in relation to those key things about representing community interest, material of local significance, capacity, management capacity, financial capacity, compliance capacity. Thanks, Hugh. And we've just got a follow-up um, comment from Philip from to our DJ. So the 12 months is in regards to the apparatus license. Maybe you can uh -huh. just Give a really quick overview on how the apparatus yes. license and the B66. My set. favorite topic, Holly. Stop me when <laughs> I get bored. I'm getting you to explain it, not me. <laughs> so, um, I think most people will be aware that um, in order to broadcast, you actually need two kinds of licenses. You need your broadcasting license, which is what we're talking about here, your five year license under the Broadcasting Service Act that says you're authorized to provide a radio service. That's actually distinct from what we will call the apparatus license, I'm not sure to what extent that's inside ACMA jargon, but it's basically a license allocated under the Radio Communications Act, and that allows you to turn a transmitter on. And these are actually distinct things. So yes, um, transmitter licenses are often uh, issued for, for um, 12 months. They don't have to be. You can take out your transmitter license for the full duration of your broadcasting service license if you want. Um, and I'm pretty sure, I'm only 90% I'm sure that you can pay for that in annual instalments. So you don't even need to pay the full five years up front. Um, it, there is a problem though, if you take it out instalment and you lose an instalment, the whole license becomes a problem. So if you're going to do an instalment payment, please make sure you pay your instalments. Um, there's an obligation on the ACMA under the Radio Communications Act that if you have a community broadcasting license under the Broadcasting Services Act, we must allocate you an apparatus license. We're still allowed to charge you for it, but it's minimum tax. It's $42 a year or something, 41. I don't know, I has got the exact number slightly wrong, but it's in the order of $42 a year. Um, and that's only charge because as you know, your broadcasting license under the Broadcasting Service Act is free. There's no charge for that at all. So yes, there is an annual license. It's basically your transmitter license. A lot of people will call it the transmitter license. Um, that is often annual, but it doesn't have to be. And if you want to change it, um, you can talk to us about, um, it's basically just taking a different box on the form but as I say if you're going to pay you know if you either pay the five years up front which in this case will be you know, in the order of two hundred dollars but if you want to pay annual installments you can do that I'm pretty sure 80% sure um, but 
it does, if you then fail to pay an instalment, it kind of creates a problem for the system, um, which, you know, this is really just bureaucrat problem, but it's um, really rather you didn't do that. Philip Was said, that clear? Did that actually make sense? Yeah, he's a light bulb moment there are two licenses i didn't know that so thanks heaps to you thanks for your question really glad we could clarify that one by we i mean hugh um we've got a question from mike scott joining us from facebook uh in the circumstances so obviously when a license gets renewed sometimes acma will write a letter with what's called conditions um so essentially it's like hey we've renewed your license but can you please think about doing x y and z or can you please do X, Y, and Z sort of in the next 12 months or in the next license period. So the question is, that's the background. The question is how does the ACMA slash CBLA ensure the conditions are implemented by the station throughout the period? Um, I guess I just wanna make the point that first and foremost, CBLA is not a regulatory body. We have nothing to do with the regulation of community broadcasters. We're here purely to listen to our members and uh, hear their concerns and provide advice and support to them and feed that back to government. So I just want to make that really clear. CWA does not play a role in this at all. Um, so Hugh, <laughs> how does the ACMA ensure that stations uh, undertake their conditions? Thanks, Holly. Look, I, I think I can't see the Facebook question. So, um, and the, but hi, Mike. Um, the, I would, I need to be careful about the word condition, and I'm not entirely sure how it's being used in this context. When I'm talking, well, I've been talking today about license conditions, and these are things in the BSA under Schedule 2, and these are conditions of the license, and if you breach that condition, that uh, gives rise to enforcement action. What usually goes on, and I'm just going to talk in the abstract here, what usually goes on. What usually goes on when we uh, renew a license is that we do, um, we, we will often, if we see opportunities for improvement, we will suggest actions and we will ask to be reported back on those actions. Now, I think um, those are not, they're not license conditions in the language of the Broadcasting Services Act. They are, I prefer to call them renewal actions. And as I was saying before, we do follow those up. We're very, um, and you know, at every renew renewal, we will look at the previous renewals, renewal actions, and go, well, did they do them? Did they do they? And if if the not doing of those renewal actions raises compliance concerns, then we go into compliance mode. But I just want to be really careful about what's going on at renewal when we're saying to people, look, you either need to do this because this is actually an illegal obligation, you've got to do it, or we're saying, look, we recommend you do this. This is, you, you know, you'll be running the station better if you do that. We, I would call those renewal actions. Um, and yes, we do monitor those. Thanks so much, you. Um, I reckon we can squeeze in one more question. Um, people just ask about content. Yes, the webinar will be ready to uh, look back at after this. We'll send that around. The slides we normally send around, but we just need to get the ACMA Big Boss to sign off on those before we can distribute those so watch this space but most hopefully we'll have those for you as well and um, we've got another question just in regards to obviously community radio stations can't broadcast advertising um but instead do sponsorship are we allowed to refer to it as advertising on merchandising online and social media obviously not saying it on air i'm just going to say very much strongly do not recommend that um while acma does not regulate your online broadcast online space um, there have been some issues with this in the past. Um, so very much would recommend steering away from using the word advertising at all times. Um, obviously, if you're in a meeting with a sponsor and you're like trying to articulate sponsorship is like advertising, but it's tagged and this is what it is. Obviously, that makes a lot of sense and you need to be able to articulate that to people. But I would really caution you on putting it in writing anywhere. Um, and I reckon we can get the last question in and then we'll wrap up. Um, Angie from CHY, is there a difference between subscribers and members? Uh, it's a really good question. Um, there's obviously lots of different models and Angie, I might try and dig out some of our resources for you. Um, sometimes it's just terminology. Sometimes there's members of the organization and then subscribers, which are financial subscribers, but don't necessarily have voting rights. Um, that's sort of the, te the, the typical distinction that we see. Um, I don't know if you have anything you'd like to add to that, Hugh? Um, look, we understand members usually, the, the usual context is they're members of the organisation that has the licence, and so they have some kind of voting right and they're subject to the constitution of the organisation. 
and we're really interested in membership because of this license condition to encourage participation in the operations of the station. So whereas, so if, if the distinction is subscription subscribers pay some money and maybe get some benefits, but they're not actually involved in the decision making because they're not members of the licensee organisation, that is a very important distinction from the ACMA's perspective because of this license condition that all community broadcasting licensees are subject to, which is to encourage participation of the community in the operations of the station. And so when I think membership, that's what I think of. I think member of the licensee organisation. Great, thank you so much, you. Um, Mel, what are some of the key areas stations struggle with in applications? That's really the, the couple of things we touched on before, community engagement, local area, local significance, um, mm -hmm. and just showing your viability as an organisation. So. Um, I think the three things we covered today really will cover that for you. And Phil's just asked about process for requesting a TX transmitter. Is that my tech knowledge lack thereof? Power increase. Um, Philip, that's a really long one. So I'm going to throw that one to Hugh. You can give him a call after this and he'd be happy to chat to you about that, I reckon. Um, that's it from us. Thank you so much to everybody that joined us today, both on the webinar and live on Facebook. Our next webinar will be Resilience and Trauma from 11am on the 7th of December. And we'll be lucky to be joined by Dart Centre speaker, Kate McManon. So please feel free to come along to that. We'll send out the registration link in due course. And of course, as always, if you'd like to contact the CWA um, if you've got follow-up questions, feel free to get in touch with me. My details are there below, above, on the screen. And of course, uh, Hugh is the head of the ACMA Community Broadcasting section, their phone number and their email address if you have any questions. Thank you, everyone. Really appreciate your time and thanks so much for Hugh for coming and Amanda as well. Thanks, everyone. Much appreciated.